the, in the order of the, the panel here, we're going to start out with uh, Gerardo Otero, who's Professor of International Studies and Sociology at Simon Fraser University in uh, British Columbia. He's published very widely on the political economy of agriculture, including books like Neoliberalism Revisited, Farewell to the Peasantry, and Food for the Few, Neoliberal Globalism and Biotechnology in Latin America. And he'll be followed by Stephanie Mercier, who's Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Farm Journal Foundation. She previously served as Chief Economist for the Democratic staff of the Senate Agriculture Committee and in the Economic Research Service of the USDA. And then we'll hear from Karen Hansen Kuhn, who works on policy, trade, and economic justice at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade. And until 2005, she also served as the International Coordinator of the Alliance for Responsible Trade, which is a U.S. multi-sectoral coalition promoting just and sustainable trade. And later on, she served as Policy Director at the U.S. Office of Action Aid, an international development organization. So we're going to start off with Gerardo. Take it away. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, thank you very much to uh, Garrett for the invitation. I've been uh, learning a lot in the past uh, couple of days, uh, around yesterday. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is uh, uh, try to zoom out of uh, the, the farm bill per se, uh, but you know, offer uh, some questions and paradoxes of uh, the trade aspect of uh, U.S. agriculture and. Uh, the first question, and I think uh, you know, that there's going to be some resonance to the first uh, speaker of uh, the first panel who talked about uh, us being too much in silos, and uh, uh, you know, we need a more holistic approach to, to this. And so, the first question I want to raise is: uh, Can trade policy be separated from science and technology policy? Uh, it seems to me that uh, science and technology policy has been one of the main causes driving U.S. agricultural surpluses since the 1930s. Uh, and uh, agricultural surpluses have forced the U.S. government to develop an aggressive trade policy to uh, place U.S. or, or uh, for the U.S. to, to dispose of all these uh, surpluses around the world, uh, often using cheap loans and geopolitical criteria. Um, and um, I mean, one irony of these with regard to the uh, science and technology policy is that the land-grant colleges uh, which were created in uh, the 1880s uh, were originally meant to help farmers, but as the decades went by, uh, the clientele, the main clientele of the land-grant colleges seems to have shifted from farmers to the large agribusiness multinationals. And, uh, so there emerges a, a, a problem here. Um, so uh, I guess uh, it is no longer farmers that are driving uh, agricultural production. It's basically uh, the large agri-food inputs producers that determine the kind of technology that farmers either adopt or get out. And they have to basically get big or get out. And I mean, these are all the, the pressures that are introduced into the agri-food system. So uh, the number two point is that since uh, after the Second World War, the United States has become one of the main uh, agri-food exporters, and thus contributing to bankrupting millions of uh, peasants in the developing world. That, again, was mentioned by the first uh, speaker today. Uh, and this has been part of this uh, government policy here to dispose of every food surpluses. Uh, and uh, the problem is, or the dilemma, that the decline of peasantries in the developing countries is correlated, if not a direct cause, of rising unemployment, illicit drug production, violence, and migration, a lot of which problems also become manifested right here in the United States. Uh, point three, since the 1990s, agricultural biotechnology has been the main technological force propelling U.S. agri-food surpluses, uh, and transgenic seed technology in particular has uh, 
been also wi uh, widely been adopted in the southern cone and beyond, where increased uh, food exports have been associated with hunger for food insecurity, as in Argentina and Brazil. So uh, it, it's not just about exporting food itself, but also the technology that has been adopted in the United States. Uh, for the fourth point, perhaps the main agri-food uh, paradox since the 1980s is that on the one hand, famines have largely ended in the world, uh, although there's still over 800 million people that are suffering from hunger. On the other hand, however, resolving this quantitative issue of insufficient availability of food has resulted in a new qualitative issue that was also mentioned by the first speaker, that uh, we're producing too many calories that are empty of nutritional content. Uh, so, and, and the problem in emerging countries, not just in, in uh, advanced capitalist countries, wealthy countries, but uh, in also middle income countries, uh, a lot of people, perhaps, you know, growing majorities of people have access to too many calories of no, low nutritional quality. And this has led to increasing rates of overweight and obesity, which complicate in the developing countries, they complicate all the issues of uh, contag contagious diseases with the appearance of new chronic diseases, uh, such as diabetes, hypertension, and some cancers associated with the new U.S. model of eating, or the U.S. diet, or what I'm actually calling in a new book about to be published uh, called the neoliberal diet. Uh, number five, and there's only six points, uh, agri-food and fast food companies are repeating what tobacco companies did when things get complicated in the United States. So if things get complicated here because people start getting too concerned with the nutrition and you know, lowering uh, their intake of this or that particular food, well, you know, they just uh, globalize. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, a couple of examples are that um, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, for instance, opened its first restaurant in China in 1987. Uh, whereas uh, McDonald's opened its first uh, restaurant in Russia in the early 1990s, as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, McDonald's was putting its foot there. Uh, although I think it's having problems right now after the uh, embargo of uh, Russia. Uh, the sixth point is, uh, and this is a very hard question for me to answer, so I'm basically going to throw it to the public, what is to be done about these issues. And just some uh, reflections about the question is are, are as follows. So that since the late 1980s, uh, there has been a growing movement toward alternative and organic agriculture. But farmers are the main agents, or, or actually this is a question. Are farmers the main agents that can change the agri-food system towards sustainability in economic, social, and ecological terms. Are not farmers actually the takers of technologies provided by the big agricultural input multinationals? And if this is so, what can social movements do to influence public policy in order to affect those corporations, the corporations that are producing the main agricultural technology that is being more or less imposed on farmers. Uh, and if they don't want to take it, well, they're likely to be booted out of the market. And final question, uh, can consumers exert pressure on large supermarket chains to demand more helpful and accessible food? Thanks very much, Eduardo. Uh, and now we'll uh, turn to Stephanie. I've got a PowerPoint. Yeah, behind me and I can't see it. So I'm like, stand up. I 
Thank you. 
what do I expect to see for the issues in the trade title and the next farm bill? Uh, there are really three main components in the trade title and the farm bill, and I worked on this uh, part of the farm bill in both the 2002 and 2008 farm bills. Uh, really, there's the international food aid programs, primarily the Title II Food for Peace, and then two smaller programs at USDA. There are the export promotion pro programs. These to include export subsidies programs like the export enhancement program that was repealed in 08, and the dairy export subsidy program was repealed in 2018, 2014. So we're talking about here the market access program, which which helps farm groups uh, access new markets overseas, and then the foreign market development program, which helps them sort of maintain um, access to existing markets. And then there's uh, always some sort of miscellaneous issues that get thrown in. I remember the Owit Farm Bill. We had a long section about trying to address the uh, ongoing dispute with Canada over soft and lumber exports. So miscellaneous stuff gets thrown into, into that title as well. Uh, these two main trade promotion programs that I mentioned, MAP and F&D, have not received a lot of attention since the 2002 Farm Bill when, we, when the committees added money to them. Uh, however, these programs have already been tagged uh, by key farm groups and commodity groups in the early discussion for much the same reason that they were focused in 02, which is the declining farm income and the hope that, that if, if they're facing stagnant income, what they're looking for are new outlets for their products overseas. So that's why there's a focus on the trade, trade programs in this Farm Bill. Next slide. What are the specific programs for addressing these issues on the trade side? Um, farm groups are justifiably concerned with what they're hearing about the Trump trade agenda and its potential impact on their markets overseas. Uh, over the course of the campaign, uh, uh, Mr. Trump talked about pulling out of TP, which he's already done. Uh, and it appears that the uh, negotiations with the European Union and the TTIP are apparently dead in the water. There's no discussions going on there. Uh, President Trump is still pushing to renegotiate NAFTA. And he's always taken very combative, uh, vocal opposition towards China in the course of the campaign. Canada, China, and Mexico were the three largest markets for, for U.S. agriculture. So the fact that he's focused on their three largest markets has been a source of a lot of concern. Uh, <laughs> at the Commodity Classic, which is held, I mean, held every year with the corn, soybean, wheat, and sorghum producers, the soybean growers met to, to push for certain issues in the Farm Bill. And one of the things they agreed to push for it was to double the funding that the MAP and FMD programs get in the Farm Bill, and a lot of the other groups support that too. So that means for MAP, that would be doubling from 200 to 400 million, and for FMD, doubling from 34 and a half to 70. So these are mandatory funds, which are stuff that the Farm Bill can allocate as opposed to uh, funds that are annually appropriated. The Farm Journal Foundation, where I work, uh, we commissioned uh, some papers last year to look at some issues uh, having the some resonance in farm bills, and one of them was on the issue of trade technical assistance in developing countries. Uh, so the recommendations out of that out of, out of that brief include uh, recommendations that we help developing countries create infrastructure that will enable their ag products to meet SPS requirements in developing countries, in developed countries, and also help improve coordination between the 21 U.S. agencies who deal in this, in this issue. And then finally, it recommended that we try to develop coordinated strategies with other countries so that so that if a farmer in, say, Zimbabwe or Zambia meets SPS requirements in the U.S., that that essentially means he's also met them in Europe and Japan as well. That would be a, a great boon for those producers. Uh, this particular policy brief is available at the, what, at the link that's there, and then the other two papers we commissioned are there as well. Next slide. Food aid. So the needs of the program have evolved over time. Unfortunately, the programs themselves have not, which is a real problem. The U.S. food aid programs have, programs have been around since the 1950s which at the time they were designed primarily for surplus disposal. The basic operating rules of the programs, which requires a U.S. sourcing of products, requires we use U.S. flag ships for half of them, and also that, that uh, we, we only use commodities and not cash for these programs. Those have changed very little over time, even though the demands on the program have changed a lot. And the chart on the side shows the increase in the share of the funds that are going to meet emergency needs rather than development needs of the program. Next slide. What are some of the issues I expect to see in the Farm Bill? Uh, each of the last three Farm Bills have included modest reforms to these U.S. food aid programs. Uh, 2002, we introduced a pre-positioning, which allows us to put food aid in warehouses overseas, which means we can be a little more responsive when a, when a real emergency arrives. And we also set up the McGovern Bill School Feeding Program. In 08, the Farm Bill provided more cash rather than commodities to be used uh, by groups who are uh, delivering food aid under, under Title II. 
and then we piloted a program to allow uh, groups to use cash in countries rather than commodities. And then in 2014, they also increased the funding for that 202E section. Uh, I expect that the groups who work on these issues are going to continue to, to push for reforms, but I think they're going to get a lot of pushback from supporters of the status quo, and that's mainly uh, the maritime industry in the United States, which clings to parental preference, and also foreign groups to a large extent. Uh, President Trump's FY18 budget proposal signals a lot of danger in these programs because it clearly disfavors both humanitarian aid and development assistance. For example, he's proposed eliminating the funding for the McGovern Dole program, and he wants a 29% reduction in foreign assistance overall. He wants to focus our resources on countries who like us, which I'm not sure how he's going to define that. And then also is looking to cut contributions to U.S. agency, UN agencies like the World Food Program. Uh, this was in what was called the skinny budget, which came out last week. Uh, there's supposed to be a more detailed budget available sometime in May, so we'll get more details. I spent a lot of time on the Hill last week talking to offices, and, and there's not much support for this kind of draconian cuts uh, in these programs, at least in the offices we met with. And that last slide. So that's, if you want to reach out to me, find out any more information, there's some contact information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to Karen. going to, again, quote a different quote uh, from Sonny Perdue, who at his confirmation hearing said he wanted to be the chief salesman around the world for U.S. farm goods. So a lot of what I'm getting to here is that, far, as Stephanie's mentioning, farm and trade policy are linked. I would argue that we need to be looking at both of those simultaneously um, because they do go hand in hand. at ITP, we decided to look back at some of the research we've done in the past. Um, and go ahead to the next slide. Um, one of those was estimating rates of dumping, which is exporting goods, farm goods in this case, at below the cost of production. Um, we did calculations of dumping. I say we, it was before my time. But in the 1990s and up to 2005, every year, that showed a persistent pattern of many U.S. farm goods cost, which is awarded by USDA, um, going out at below the cost of production. This was a huge issue in the WTO debate, uh, where uh, developing countries argued that this was very harmful to their farmers, as has happened with the Mexican farmers, but in other cases, when floods of cheap goods would come into their market. Also, those farmers or those countries that were trying to export, um, particularly cotton, on what was happening to the developing country farmers. 
and that is certainly important. But we would argue that it's affecting U.S. farmers as well. You know, we see these cycles of low prices, the, farm, the financial crises we're hearing about now, they are connected to this policy, these policies. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying we should not export. We absolutely should. But we need to have the right rules to get us to a better system. So next slide. When we look at dumping, um, we look basically at four sources of data, um, which is the methodology we used in the past as well. We looked at USDA data for four crops on cost of production. Now this includes things like seed and fertilizer, uh, but also the opportunity costs of land and labor. Um, so some costs that might not seem so direct but are in fact part of the cost of production. We looked at data from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development on producer support. So this is public money going to agriculture attributed to specific crops. <coughs> Transportation was trickier. Um, but as a proxy, we took for different crops the difference between the price near the point of production, say wheat in Kansas, and the price, the export price of the Gulf, um, as a, an estimate for what distribution and transportation costs would be. So adding up these costs of production, um, go to the next slide, um, we have these new estimates. What, what's happened with dumping. Now, the, the period before this was the period of food price prices. Prices spiked. And in fact, many of us thought the era of dumping was over. Uh, but what we see in the last few years is as prices have fallen, what seems to be a return to dumping. Um, for 2015, we found dumping rates using this methodology, which is an estimate of wheat 32%, corn 12%, soy 10%, rice in the past, we also estimated for cotton, we found that the data sources um, were, were more confusing for cotton, so we're hoping to do more with that in the future. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. You could say we're returning to the system we had before, to this persistent dumping. We think what's more likely is this is one more cycle in the volatility that we've experienced lately. Hard to know. We'll see in a few years. But in any case, whether it's persistent dumping or cycles of volatile price swings, it undermines farmers' interests here and in developing countries. It makes it harder for them to make planning decisions. It makes it harder for them to have stable incomes. The next slide. When these issues came up in the 2000s and when they were so hot in WTO circles, um, a lot of it was about cutting the subsidies. You know, there were all these comments made about how that was the fault of it. But if you look at this, the, the little orange stripe there, um, that is the amount of subsidies compared to the other costs of production and transportation. It's, it's nowhere near um, what seems to be the problem here. It, but it does, it does provide, the subsidy system we have now, primarily crop insurance, does contribute to certain patterns of production. And I think one thing I'm hearing today is that we need to think more creatively about what kinds of support we want to give to agriculture to get us perhaps to different outcomes. Uh, but certainly for now, it is a, a kind of glue that holds the system together. So next slide. Um, when we talk about dumping, it seems pretty counterintuitive. How could farmers be selling it below the cost of production? Um, some of this is the fact that farmers, unlike agribusinesses, have, you know, they're locked in for at least prices aren't looking good for cotton, it's, pr it's not so easy to switch into something else. Um, also, in the short term, farmers will get off farm jobs. They will forego those returns to labor and land that should be part of the cost of production. Um, so this leads to, again, these cycles of instability that hurt not only farmers in developing countries, but in the U.S. as well. So next slide. Now here, it's always hard to get to what the solutions are. I think they're overlapping in the same way the problems are overlapping. Um, we've heard some discussion here about supply management. Um, I think taking another look at grain reserves is something that should be considered in the Farm Bill. In the last Farm Bill, the National Farmers Union had a proposal uh, for what they called a market-driven inventory system. 
farmer, farmer managed reserves. And I mean, I think it gets to the point in the previous panel that sometimes, and they were trying in the, the acronym was MIDAS. And the idea was to get at people hear supply management in Washington and they say, oh no, we did that before, we're not going to do that again. Maybe we need to shake things up a little bit, think creatively. But I know that that proposal and some of the ones Harwood's working on now, um, you know, do. Don't repeat what was done before, but try to get at this idea of how you stabilize prices uh, so that they're fair. Trade policy would need to be reformed as well, um, as well as I think there are ideas for transparency in, in commodity markets that could help, uh, help also help farmers to be making their decisions. So next slide. Um, so again, getting out of silos. So NAFTA debate's coming up next. Uh, we're hearing rumors that I don't know. We've been hearing rumors for a while that they're going to announce the negotiations are starting any day. But in any case, um, that will be a time, I think, that would be good to focus not only on the issues I'm raising here, but I think looking again, taking stock of where we are. Um, our supply chains, say for meat and feed, are very complicated right now in North America. Like when I hear proposals that we will just raise tariffs or do some kind of sledgehammer approach, it's kind of hard for me to imagine how that would work out because we have, say, feed going to Mexico, cattle being raised there, processed here, exported here and there. It's a complex system. And I think some of what we need to do is take stock of exactly what is the status of that system? What are those supply chains? And also, who has power along the way? Um, but in any case, again, it's sort of shaking up our assumptions. And as others have mentioned, how money is spent in the Farm Bill and then the Farm Bill provisions themselves will, of course, be crucial as we move forward. So the last slide is just my contact information and our website. Um, like I said, these are some early ideas. As a paper, we're working on, on the dumping calculations, which I'm doing with Sophia Murphy, also from INPP. Uh, we hope we'll be out in the next month or so. We're sort of wrapping it up. Um, but anyway, I hope it adds Thanks very much for our panelists. So let's uh, take a round of uh, maybe three questions or comments to get us started. Uh, and we should probably float around with a mic to uh, uh, capture that. So uh, yes, uh, Karen. Uh, Karen Spangler, I'm with Food Policy Action. And I guess I wanted to just start off for all three of you asking, um, how has it been to, um, in the last few months, and especially uh, after uh, Trump's remarks and his positioning on trade, how has it been for, for you as people that maybe work on an issue that is somewhat esoteric to most of the US population, but is now becoming central to things that are mentioned in the news every single day, and what will drive the political agenda? How, how do you respond when you're trying to explain these kind of issues to the general public or to reporters in ways that maybe you didn't have to when people were, uh, when it wasn't as central? Thanks, next question from uh, Jim Goodman, and please identify yourselves right there. Uh, I'm Jim Goodman, uh, daily farmer from Wisconsin. And I wanted to address uh, Gerardo's uh, question farmers can be an agent of change, and if consumers can exert pressure, and I guess I would say yes to both, but I think the only way that can work is if they know, if the food is labeled. And I know Harwood mentioned that if people aren't getting free food, that's what we should give them, but they have to know that it's, they have to be labeled that way. And industry has made a concerted effort not to label things that they think consumers might reject, be it GM labeling, whatever. So I think if we want, and the country of origin labeling was another one that we've just recently heard about. So I think, yes, we can all be agents of change, but we have to know, know the choice. So I think that's pretty important. Thank you. One more? Other? Uh, yes, in front here. Thank you. Hi, I am Emily. Uh, I'm with Georgetown. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, you, you briefly mentioned the land grant colleges. With increasing tech research costs, how can farmers regain some control over uh, where research 
thanks. So it's, I think, uh, responses in the original Wharton Cellars, but there are other you'd like to go first. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, Karen's question about the, the media. Uh, the first week after Donald Trump assumed uh, the presidency, after, including uh, on January 20th, I had uh, an interview with a number of radio stations, you know, like uh, local and national radio stations in Canada. And there was even a, a, an interview from a station in, in South Korea, in an English uh, station. And that was probably the best one, because it was 15 minutes. The others were, you know, five minutes. And I mean, okay. We're not used to speaking for just five or even 10 <laughs> minutes. Right? As professors, you know, you need 45 minutes an hour. But anyway, uh, it's been you know very very short uh, mm. questions, and yeah, there's a great concern because I mean Canada, I think depends about you know 25 percent of its uh, uh, trade is with the U.S. In Mexico, it's like 80 percent. So I mean both countries are really dependent on the U.S. Whereas the, the opposite is not the truth. I mean the, both Canada and Mexico are very important uh, uh, trade partners of the U.S., but relatively speaking, they represent very low percentages of its uh, GDP and so on and so forth. So it could dispose of both neighbors. Not too easily, though, because there would be uh, tremendous ramifications, as uh, Karen indicated here. Uh, the, the commodity chains, and not just in agri-food, but in, in automobiles, the automobile sector is tremendously implicated you know, in the three countries. Um, labeling uh, GMOs, I think uh, that's uh, I mean, I, I'm all in favor of that, but I think that's really insufficient because that places the whole burden of changing the agri-food system on consumers, on individuals, you know, and like, uh, you know, making decisions one dinner at a time, uh, vote with your fork. I think all these appeals are completely partial and insufficient. We need a more systemic kind of approach to, to changing things at their root, because uh, I don't think, uh, you know, farmers have much choice. Uh, I mean, they do have choice whether to adopt GMOs or not, but if you're not adopting GMOs, you're completely out of the mainstream of the system. So, uh, and uh, in terms of the, the question of the, about land grant colleges, I mean, I take a GMO, uh, that, that was a, a question I think directed to me that, um, it, again, uh, it seems to me like uh, farmers, <coughs> unfortunately, are no longer driving the research agenda. It's the multinationals, the agribusiness multinationals that, that drive it. Uh, <coughs> and a lot of it is done with public funds. Uh, but another source that started in the Reagan years, because there were all these uh, uh, new laws um, enabling universities to patent their, their research and to patent biological material. And that became an important source of uh, what has become the neoliberal university of uh, also marketing its research and so on and so forth. And uh, so everything is linked to neoliberalism now and not to farmers. Thanks, so where does Yeah, so on the, on the first question, on the trade thing, a lot of the focus of the Trump rhetoric on trade during the election was, was sort of defensive. We need to figure out a way to reduce imports. Whereas what ag cares about is the offensive side. They want to increase their exports. And I think it's taken a while for the Trump people to, to figure that out. And it's going to be very hard to address both priorities in a single set of negotiations, even on a bilateral basis, because it, despite what he seems to believe, we can't win everything. It, it's got to be a negotiated resolution and, and the other country, the other player, has to get some wins. And on, on markets like NAFTA, U.S. farmers are already in a very good position. They have really an unfettered access to the Mexican market and with, with a few exceptions in the Canadian market, and it can really only get worse from their, it, from their perspective in terms of access into those markets. So it, it's taken ag a while to, to, to push the notion that the, the rhetoric that the president talked about during the election doesn't really apply in the, in the case of agriculture because it's one of the few sectors in, in the U.S. economy where we have a trade, net trade balance with, with our resource partners. I think uh, airlines, airplanes is the other major category. Everything else, we have a net trade deficit with the rest of the world. 
on labeling. Um, I was on uh, on the Ag Committee when, when we passed the, the country of origin labeling and watched the, the uh, uh, trade dispute. And, and to me, it seemed as though the, the meat packing companies implemented in the most trade destroying way they possibly could, almost trying to encourage the Canadians and the Mexicans to, to file a case so that they, they never wanted the country of origin labeling. And so they, I, I really feel as though they effectively sabotaged the, the chance to see it work properly because they, they implemented it in such a way to, to be sure to offend the Canadians and Mexicans. Um, now there's rhetoric that we may try it again. I don't think that's much appetite on Capitol Hill for doing that. I guess I would just add, particularly on the first question, um, in January, well, we have been working with uh, different family farm groups in the United States, National Family Farm Coalition, Rural Coalition through the Water Watch National Farmers Union before the elections to talk about, like many groups, to think forward on what we thought might be happening. Uh, and we had to step back after the elections to think about if those proposals still made sense. Um, but we decided in the case of NAFTA and farm policy uh, that it was important that we come out early in January um, with some ideas about what we thought should be happening. You know, that the focus should be on things like enhancing rural resilience, you know, as part of the objectives, that we should be shaking up our thinking and, and starting to open, raise these ideas early on. So we started to have, and, and also I think to, uh, to work in coalition. Um, we, we are part of Citizens Trade Campaign, which includes labor, environmental, and other groups. Um, so we share information about what is still a very confusing terrain about what might be coming next. Um, so I think that's some of it in terms of the outreach. Um, as we uh, brought our ideas together, we had to make things simpler to get started. And it wasn't that we thought particularly that um, many of these things could happen in the short term, but there are some things like restoring country of origin labeling. You know, if Mexico and Canada were to drop their, their case, then there could be an opening, even though I think it's not there yet in Congress. Um, but I think it's worth having the conversation about consumers' right to know and how that links to farm interests. Um, so, so anyway, I guess that, that's sort of where things stand. I, I, you know, I do find myself, I work mainly on trade policy, mainly in that direction. But I also want to say, like, I've heard some such interesting ideas here about how we get past what I would say is an impasse or automatic rejection of the idea of supply management. farm system and might also have the effect of stabilizing things. I don't know, but I think, as I said, we have to shake up our thinking and, and think creatively. Thanks very much. So we have uh, another round of uh, three questions to shake things up. Uh, yes, in back. Yes, sir, Beth? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I'm back? Okay. Sorry. Hey, uh, I'm Elizabeth uh, Wilkes here, and um, I'm curious, um, I know you mentioned kind of this, you know, idea of like four notion of tax proposals, for example, um, for the president of intelligence. Um, can you just, like, if that were to have a kind of go through, you know, what sort of effects you might see or what, I don't know, just your thoughts on potential for four notion of tax. Um, and secondly, any, any thoughts on, on China? And then in front here, uh, 
know, low prices um, globally, like the idea of dumping and whether those two are ever um, closely related. Um, so, yeah, if you could just speak about that idea. Okay, back to our panel. started out as an airport disposal program back in the 1950s. Uh, at that point, food aid was a significant part of sort of U.S. ag exports. So I think in 1957, it was like 30 percent of the huge component of it. Food aid is now less than half a percent of U.S. ag exports, so we are mostly, almost entirely commercial now. Uh, so I worked very hard when I was on the Senate Ag Committee to wean us away from even using that phrase in relation to, to, to food aid because it's really not how the what drives the program now? What really drives the program now is what is the need, uh, especially since so much of it is, is to feed emergency, under emergency situation. However, that language is starting to creep back in. Typically, some people talking about food aid. I know there was a letter from uh, Kansas uh, Senator uh, Jerry Moran to the USAID uh, last summer uh, a asking them to amp up their purchases of wheat in order to provide a, a bigger outlet. a little disturbed by that notion that there are some in Congress willing to embrace that concept again. It, it's not going to have much use because, frankly, it, it just is a small share of what we do internationally that it's not going to have much impact. And creeping back, in, having that language creep back into our vocabulary, I think, is, is harmful from the point of view of, of, of our credibility in the future. Um, on the Border Adjustment Tax, I mean, uh, what we know about those kinds of taxes is that the burden typically falls on the consumer. So mm -hmm. if that something gets implemented like that, it would generally fall on, on us as consumers rather than I think what the target is is, is those foreign countries. So I don't I don't favor that as a part of the national package. <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. oh, uh, just a quick comment on the uh, food aid thing. Uh, it seems to me like uh, historically uh, <coughs> became associated uh, to the concept of uh, food security and uh, in the sense that uh, food security should be achieved either through aid or trade. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, the, the discourse on food security with this kind of definition, uh, it's having access to sufficient food and so on and so forth, uh, started in the 1970s, but it really took on in the 1980s. And it's part of, of this uh, neoliberalization uh, discourse of uh, winning nations or countries away from self-sufficiency programs and opening up uh, to agricultural trade. So, I mean, it's been a whole discourse in super-state organizations from the FAO to the World Bank and, and so on, uh, the World Trade Organization, of course. Uh, and um, anyway, yeah, that, that's, that's it on that. Um, on dairy, uh, I don't know that much. I mean, I just know that Canada does have a supply management uh, uh, in, in dairy and uh, also uh, in eggs. And that those are two of the things that uh, uh, were going to be given up uh, if the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, had gone through. Uh, I mean, that was demanded by, I believe, Australia and New Zealand who have very strong uh, dairy sectors. So um, how to achieve fairness between consumers and producers, I suppose uh, maybe Karen can tell us more about that on, on supply management uh, uh, programs. Uh, but I think it's doable um, in some ways so that, uh, and I think that here's a very strong difference between farmers and agribusiness. I think farmers seek primarily uh, simple reproduction of their labor power. Uh, <coughs> some people use the word profit, but I don't think profit is what uh, farmers are after. They're after uh, a decent livelihood. And uh, so there's not necessarily a capitalist profit that must be contained there. So uh, in that sense, it would be even more advantageous if uh, family farmers that are simple reproducers are the ones who take care of most uh, of the food production rather than agribusiness uh, corporations or capitalist farmers. Um, 
I won't say anything about China because that's too big. <laughs> <laughs> jump in uh, with a, a follow-up comment on, uh, on food emergencies and, and trade. You know, we just had uh, St. Patrick's Day not long ago, and that led to the, what are occasional uh, attempts to change the usual narrative about way, the way uh, Irish potato famine was remembered, because what most people don't remember is that there were, well, at the same time there was mass starvation, there was also m massive exports of, of other crops from the, the British imperial uh, estates uh, at the same time. So there it wasn't actually a food crisis, it was a crisis of, for, of, of farmers uh, who ended up uh, having to, to leave. On the question of dumping specifically and food emergencies and aid, I think I'm gonna look at the literature on uh, US rights in Haiti. That's one of the more extreme cases I believe Tina as well. Uh, on the question of what's gonna happen with budgets and emergency aid, you know, they, it's, it's the dominant system, the system that Stephanie mentioned were um, US flagged ships and, and requiring U.S. procurement, it is one of the most inefficient ways of actually getting a bang for the buck from the point of view of actually helping food reach people. And this local and regional procurement that Karen mentioned is really uh, really the way to go. And in, in, in theory, you could imagine the U.S. spending much less money, but much more of that actually reaching uh, farmers, because often there is food in the regional markets. Uh, the question is, what's the capacity to buy the food for the people whose crops uh, failed? And uh, I'd actually you know, welcome if anyone knows of any actual studies of these, these pilot programs that moved in that direction. I'd love to hear more about how, how far did they go. I know that the, the, the so-called localization of the USAID agenda didn't go nearly as far as the original uh, Obama USAID reform uh, project had hoped. The pushback from vested interest was very strong, just as, uh, and, and it wasn't just, in this case, it wasn't just uh, the, uh, the the maritime interest. You have lar large U.S. Uh, uh, non-governmental organizations that also uh, make uh, quite a bit from these programs, some of whom actually get their U.S. procured grain and they sell it in local markets and then use that money to do other things. That's a, actually an incredible perverse uh, system that uh, other U.S. NGOs have criticized, for example, Oxfam, to, uh, to little effect so far. At the same time, just one last point, this, 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 une this possible coexistence of Continued food availability and availability in markets at the same time as there are, uh, you know, food security crises. That it's not clear to me that whether that applies to a open war situations where it's really war that's driving, and the, the the four simultaneous famines that are looming as the you know the biggest food crisis since uh, World War II 
are, you know, Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Nigeria, at least, at least three out of four of those are, are war-driven. Uh, and so that really does, we'll see whether the, uh, you know, very disturbing headlines and photos are going to have some kind of impact on, uh, on, on uh, the U.S. Uh, food export and emergency aid policy. Yeah. So uh, with respect to the, the pilot program that was in the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, the Farm Bill required uh, USDA to commission an outside group to actually study it. So there was a, there was a uh, one study by uh, um, MSI International, and then there was a separate coalition of uh, NGOs and some folks at Cornell University who did a study, and, and the results were pretty consistent that food purchased through the LRP was consistently 20, 30, 40 percent cheaper because you weren't having to actually ship it overseas. There were a few uh, exceptions, uh, uh, vegetable oil, the more processed foods tended to be more expensive overseas than they were here. So that was one result, and the other result is that they were consistently faster to deliver, on average, 14 weeks sooner to get to the recipients when it was purchased locally or regionally than when it was purchased and then shipped to the United States. So there are very clear results from that pilot program. Um, on the, the, the Chris, Chris uh, Barrett, who's a professor at Cornell, wrote a book several years ago about food aid, where he coined the phrase Iron Triangle to describe the components of the status quo on food aid. And that was maritime, uh, farm and uh, commodity groups, and, and NGOs. I would say that the NGO community uh, in the last farm bill was split on this issue, but there's been a lot of pushback, uh, especially on the Hill, from those groups, and, and the coalition that was that was supporting the status quo has dissolved. So that the, to the extent that there was uh, at least a component of the NGO community supporting the status quo, that cohesion within that, that subgroup has died off quite a bit. Uh, farm groups pay lip service to it, but I don't think they're going to put a lot of energy towards it. This really, to me, it's mainly the maritime folks who are defending the status quo. To lesser extent, farm groups, but, but really the maritime folks. Thanks. If I recall, CARE was one of the big players that broke ranks with the status quo and, yeah, and went that over was, to the... That was even before the, the 08 farm bill, so they've been right. uh, advocates of reform for right. many years. Great. Okay, another round of questions. Yes, please. I just... Okay, you can get my Spanish. <laughs> I, I'm just, uh, I have too many, actually, too many questions out of these two sessions. But I, I just, I decided to choose one. Uh, I remember in 2008, prices were so high. And, and the sentiment was that we were not able to produce enough food for everybody. And now prices are so low, or are going down. And, and the sentiment is that we are producing too much. And, and farmers are not getting enough uh, uh, income. So uh, the danger is that policy is driven by this uh, cycle in, in, in the market. And, and now we are talking about, uh, for a long time, we were in a path of free trade uh, agreement, also, and now we are talking about the uh, supply management uh, system. So can you imagine if Brazil, Argentina, uh, all the countries do the same thing? Apply or adopt a, a supply management system. How do you mind, uh, imagine a, a world environment uh, where everybody manages the, the supply of food? And can you imagine how can you see that as a uh, result of that would be a more stable uh, system and, and price more stable and income more stable? I, I, I just wonder about that because I'm, I'm, I'm worried that now that prices are low, are, are our way of thinking is totally different as it was in 2008. Thanks. Uh, next one. Amanda. Hi. Um, my name is Amanda, and I'm with the Center for Food Safety. Could you elaborate a little bit on how the maritime, you're saying the maritime organizations further the status quo? Okay, then I'm going to jump in with a question here that gets back to the NAFTA question. I mean, in, in the we look back at the, uh, the the ag side of NAFTA. We see that basically the U.S. Uh, many U.S. players were, were huge winners. We've got you know, the, obviously the grain exporters. We also have the integrated supply chains with Smithfield and, and pork. We have the integrated uh, supply chains with fruits and vegetables. Baja California supplying strawberries and so forth. So we have all of these uh, very substantial uh, uh, interests that have been in the U.S. that have been uh, benefiting from NAFTA. Many of them are based in 
districts that voted for Trump. So how and when are they going to act in defense of their interests, or are they going to continue to go along for the ride? cargo preference, and, and it requires that at least 50% of all U.S. food aid that's sourced in the United States has to be shipped on what are called U.S. flag ships. Um, and these are ships that, that are owned by U.S. companies, and, and, and um, so they get the preference. Uh, the result of the cargo preference is that um, they, it's sort of a sort of a market power thing, where they, because they have this preference in there, they, they are able to demand higher prices for the price of the, ship, the U.S. food aid they ship uh, than, than foreign flags. So we, we did, a, I did an analysis with the colleague in Montana State. We, we found that as a result of cargo preference, uh, we spend at least $50 million a year more just to ship it on the U.S. flag ships than we would if we only, if, if it were essentially an open bidding process, which is not. So that's that's the source of that. The, the, the reason we have cargo preference is the, the notion that we need to maintain viability of the U.S. flagships in order to be able to carry U.S. military cargo in the event of an extended overseas military deployment. But recent history suggests that, that they would not serve for that purpose. Um, what they're really looking for is to maintain the supply chain mariners, and I think, frankly, there are less expensive ways to do that, especially since over the last few years the burden of that higher freight rates falls entirely on the program. They used to be reimbursed by the Department of Transportation, but they no longer are. So now it means that $50 million essentially comes out of the backs of people who otherwise wouldn't get a food aid. Let me uh, say a few things about uh, this question on uh, prices, uh, 2008 and beyond. Uh, I think uh, the a uh, very important cause of the world global food price crisis in 2008 had to do with uh, U.S. policy uh, by the George Bush administration to promote ethanol production, because that took about 40% of the corn production, uh, I mean, diverted it from, to, instead of uh, to produce food, it was diverted to produce feed for cars. And, uh, and that had a geopolitical motivation of trying to win the United States off of uh, the dependency of oil imports uh, from the Middle East. And at, at that time, in the mid-2000s, I believe uh, the imports of oil uh, were in the order of more than 60% uh, in the United States. So, I mean, oil has been a very critical factor in driving U.S. policy in a number of other areas. Uh, eventually came the um, shale, Shale oil, you know, the fracking uh, shale, uh, oil. shale oil, and and that drove production in the United States, you know, very high. I mean, gas and, and oil, and uh, so that may have contributed to the eventual collapse in oil prices in 2014. Partly as a geopolitical move uh, from Saudi Arabia that uh, you know dug its heels in terms of keeping up production, so that prices you know kept going down. Uh, Maybe in part to make you know all those new small shell producers go bankrupt, and also the, the oil sands in Canada, and, and that has to do with farm prices because I mean a very large chunk of the costs in, in, of uh, farm prices it, it has to do with oil, you know, energy costs because I mean farming in the United States is extremely energy intensive, a lot more energy intensive than the caloric energy that it produces, in fact. So there's an incredible irrationality in, in how we produce food uh, in North America. Uh, I just want to say one word about uh, China. Well, not one word, a few more than <laughs> that. But, uh, so I mean, China has been one of 10 countries that I've been studying with comparatively with macro data. And I mean, one thing I noticed is that uh, Taking you know from the 1980s until now, by far China has increased its uh, average per capita caloric uh, food caloric intake 
more than any other country. All right, and they substantially increased uh, their intake of uh, fruits and vegetables and also meats, several meats, uh, particularly pork. I mean, they're, they're very partial to pork, although beef is becoming a really watcher uh, item, uh, food item. To the point that uh, in, I think in October of 2015, they reconverted these uh, Boeing uh, 447, no, that's the jumbo jet. They reconverted it to transport cows from Australia straight to China because there was such a big demand and the dairy industry in Australia was in crisis. So, uh, I mean, they were gonna get twice as much by shipping the, the cows to, to China where they were gonna use them entirely they have all these kinds of uses for the bones and, and all the different parts of the cow. So anyway, I mean, China is, uh, that's one part. The other part, I guess, is that, you know, for the feeding pork, they're demanding lots and lots of soybeans, both from the United States and from South America, from Brazil and Argentina. So, I mean, this is part of the, the U.S. model of production that I was talking about, you know, based on biotechnology. I mean, soybeans are primarily GMO produced, uh, Roundup ready, uh, for the most part, etc. So, yeah. Jonathan, to respond to your question about NAFTA and, and how do we get here, given that the rural America strongly supported uh, President Trump, I, I think we need to make the distinction between farmers, who I think mainly do value access to international markets, and non-farmers in rural areas who see uh, job displacement going on. And, and the, the farmers sort of got lost up. Uh, the farmers didn't support him necessarily because of the stance on trade. I think it was more on his stance on, stance on regulation, which they really wanted to see a lot of what Obama did on uh, Clean Water Act and, and emissions and a range of issues pulled back. I, I think that was the thing that they focused on, you know, uh, not so much on the trade. <coughs> mm. so just to add a little bit more to these comments, um, I mean, I certainly, it's certainly true that the food price crisis in 2008 was driven in, in large part by ethanol, uh, the increased ethanol targets especially, that they increased so dramatically. Um, but it was also, you know, excessive speculation on commodity markets. It was extreme weather events that happened in Australia and some other places. So that all of that is just to say, as with all of these, these are systemic problems. There's not going to be any one solution. There has been, since then, though, a lot more discussion internationally about establishing grain reserves in different places. Um, and, and so I think in, in West Africa especially, there were some really important conversations about how to coordinate better. On the other hand, India has a, an imperfect but large program to stockpile grain, and the U.S. is challenging that as WTO. Um, so, you know, we have... I mean, I would say we should be figuring out what's a better approach, but anyway, so we have these things coming up that, that make it harder to get to solutions. And then I guess just a little bit more on, on who voted for Trump. I would say of these big corporations that dominate different supply chains, like if we look at meat um, or meat processing, four companies control 85% of meat processing in the United States. And one of those is JBS, that's Brazilian, right? So I'm guessing that's not a big part of the equation in terms of support. Uh, what we've been saying on, on NAFTA specifically is, you know, if he's serious about this, he should start with field hearings. He should hear what farmers actually think is going on and not just listen to the JBSs of the world or the Farm Bureau or whoever, but have, you know, start with the real process of consultation. Okay, thanks very much. Now, I don't think we can assume that foreign interests don't get involved in U.S. electoral politics <laughs> anymore. But, uh, but, again anymore. <laughs> but uh, we have time for just one more question or comment. So I think Jim's looking uh, like he wants to say I don't want to. I've already had my turn. But I don't hit the other hand. So <coughs> please, uh, please have uh, the last well, comment. Well, since Karen asked me about dairy, I mean, you know that the, the EU just cut off its quotas. And they produce so much milk that now they're subsidizing their dairy farmers just we have been to, so you know, history repeats itself. Um, and from my experience watching dairy farms grow in the U.S., when a new facility is built, 
facilities are built so they can double the capacity, the housing facilities, the feed storage. The only thing they generally don't do that with is a manure storage. And that creates a whole set of environmental problems because they have to spread more manure and less land and so on. And, and the other thing that I wanted to comment on and, and get Gerardo's comment, he, he's mentioned GM several times. And the only way to get GM crops in many countries is with, as Karen mentioned, the sledgehammer approach because civil society does not really want this in most cases. And I've been involved with several civil society groups in Europe, and that's one of the main things they protest is they don't want it. And we, it's promoted in the U.S. as being more environmentally friendly, higher yields, a potential for better nutrition. None of those have really come to pass. Yes, the yields are higher, but that's due mostly to increased plant populations. Right? 90 percent of the increase in corn and soybean yields is higher plant populations. And true, GM enables that because they tolerate and need more pesticides and more fertilizer and the yields go up. But there, you know, there's really no yield gain. But that's kind of the way the average person is to believe that this is a, a really great technology because in and of itself it produces a higher yield and we know that it, it, it does. And we know that the pesticide tolerance is failing. Um, but there's so much money to be made because if, if people are planting twice as many seeds per acre, the company that sells the seeds is getting twice as much money, there's less more pesticides. Um, it's, it's that uh, neoliberal capitalist model companies that are controlling the things are making the money and really not the farmers. Not, I guess maybe that's not a question, but please comment. <laughs> sure. Okay, just a brief uh, final word. Thanks for taking us back up the supply chain here. Yeah, um, I'll just uh, give you a, a, an example of what happened in, in Brazil with uh, transgenic uh, soybeans. Um, they, they started to be introduced in Argentina first, uh, you know, years before, a couple of years before uh, it they were legal in Brazil. And so there were some states in Brazil that were resisting uh, the GMOs and you know, they had laws banning them. And so what was happening is that they were smuggling the, the GMOs from Argentina into Brazil. And uh, you know, since they were addicted to, to Roundup, they were being called Maradona uh, seeds. Because Maradona is a very high performance uh, football player, you know, soccer. <laughs> and, but he also had some addiction. <laughs> so, um, you know, these Maradona seeds. Anyway, uh, eventually, in I think uh, 2005, the, the seeds were legalized in Brazil, and now uh, there are some uh, caricature maps talking about the United Soybean Republic of the Southern Cone, uh, with Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, Argentina, and Brazil, and there are companies that control up to 300,000 hectares. So land ownership is completely irrelevant at this point in, in these places because uh, it's the management, is the leasing of the land, and it's the technology that's driving the whole soybean production there. Um, so I'm not sure if that. Yeah, that's, I, I think that, that that paradigm of production not just here, but in other countries, is, is a part of what most people don't, they just don't get, they don't know what's going on. Great, so what, would our other panelists like to have any other last words? If not, then uh, let, thanks everyone for getting past silos and a crowd that uh, actually knows something about silos, so thanks very much. <laughs>